You are listening to RudolfSteinerAudio.com. If you are listening to the podcast of this, it is located at RudolfSteiner.Podbean.com. Please consider becoming a patron. As well, there are two publishing houses, SteinerBooks.org in America and RudolfSteinerPress.com in England, who are the sole publishers of Steiner into English and have given me permission to do these recordings. Please consider patronizing them as well. This is a reading of a cycle of lectures by Rudolf Steiner entitled Wonders of the World, Trials of the Soul, and Revelations of the Spirit. This is Lecture 4. You will have gathered from the last lecture in what way to accept what was, first, what was said in the first, that the Greeks both beheld and thought of all nature as penetrated with spirit, and that a conception of nature such as ours did not exist among them. You'll have seen this from the way I have endeavored to represent the mutual relationship of the three great divine beings in Grecian spiritual life, Zeus, Poseidon. I have shown you that we must think of the microcosmic forces appertaining to the astral body of man as extended through the world of space. If we picture the ruler or central power of these forces as superpersonal, or superhuman, we get an idea of the feeling which the Greeks connected with the word Zeus. We have seen that the same holds good for the, about the extension in space of the forces of the etheric body and their relation to Poseidon, and also of the forces within our physical body and their relation to Hades or Pluto. Now the question has doubtless forced itself upon you. How is it with the fourth principle of our being? For in our own time we must recognize the human being as a whole, as composed of physical, etheric, and astral bodies, and of the ego or ego vehicle. Now from the very beginning we must quite understand that since the position of the ego with regard to the other principles of the human being is unique, the forces of the universe corresponding to the ego, when rightly understood, must also occupy a special position. We can say of the forces of the physical body that they are relegated to the realms of space and are there governed by the central power of Hades. Similarly, we look upon Poseidon as the ruler of the forces of the etheric body and Zeus as the ruler of the forces of the astral body. When, however, we come to consider the ego itself, we find that it is in the closest contact with everything in our lives that takes place in the world around us. Indeed, we enter into the world with the ego principle. Our whole fate depends on the events which affect our ego, all our happiness or misery. But if we but, we, but, if we but think of it a little, we must feel that the forces of our ego are very different from those forces of Hades which extend throughout space. As the fate of our ego is closely connected with our surroundings here, So we must think of the forces of the ego as connected with the divinely spiritual forces which correspond to this principle in surrounding space, in the same way as the other divinely spiritual forces are connected with the soul forces. Reflect how closely we are related to our environment as regards all the experiences of our ego. How different are the feelings of our ego when we raise our eyes and plunge into the depths of the starry heavens, or when we gaze on the rosy hues of sunset and dawn into all the wonders of the setting or the rising sun. How little are we able to detach our ego from all this? How closely are we bound up with the macrocosm? Through our ego we are ourselves poured out into what surrounds us. That which comes to us from without, the golden sunbeam or the majesty of the starry firmament, is at one moment an external object in the macrocosm, the next an idea within the human soul, within the microcosm. In actual life we can hardly distinguish the one from the other. They flow one into the other. Considering the direct way in which the Greek envisaged the world and its wonders, We may assume that he pictured the divinity representing to him the ego forces and holding sway in space as much more intimately allied with man than the other gods whom he thought of as actually remote from human nature. 
Hence we find a divinity who represented to the Greeks the ego forces in the world of space, who, one might say, had a certain affinity with human nature, whose fate, whose conduct, through all the vicissitudes of life, may be said to be very human. This is Dionysus. As we must regard Hades as the representative of the forces of the physical body, spread abroad in the cosmos, Poseidon as the representative of the forces of the etheric body, and Zeus as that of the forces of the astral body. So Dionysus must be, for us, the macrocosmic representative of the forces of the soul as lived out within our ego. Now the whole attitude of the Greeks toward Dionysus, that figure recently presented to our own ego in so remarkable a manner in the mystery of Eloisus, will become clearer to us when we have reflected a little in what way spiritual powers and spiritual beings take part in our earthly existence and enter into the wonders of which our our own human life is composed. You will find much of what I have to say by way of interpolation in these lectures in a book of mine which has just appeared, in which the essence is given of lectures delivered by me a short time ago in Copenhagen. It is called titled The Spiritual Guidance of Man and of Mankind, which is also on this website. From this work I shall have to cite passages connected with my present purpose. That to which we must meantime turn our attention is the fact that mankind, evolving as it does on earth, determining its own fate, shaping by degrees the epochs of its own civilization, is guided by beings whom we must characterize as superhuman, who are meantime beyond the range of human sense perceptions and are found mainly in the higher worlds, attainable only to clairvoyant sight. When we turn to the category or class of beings next to man who are entrusted with the guidance of the human race, we come to those beings who are known to Oriental mystic tradition as the Dhyani and in Christian mysticism as angels. I have often described these superhuman beings, and you know what their position is. We know also that they were once human, but under conditions of life totally different from our own. That was during the old lunar evolution, when our earth was passing through its previous embodiment. At that time these angelic beings, who now play a part in the guidance of the human race, passed through their human stage, and at the beginning of the present evolution of our earth were therefore so far advanced that they stood one degree higher in their evolution than our present humanity. And at the end of the evolution of the earth, that proportion of the human race which has attained the goal of its terrestrial evolution will be as far on as the angelic beings were at the close of the lunar evolution. Hence these beings are well qualified to guide man along the path that shimmers immediately above him. They take part in our human evolution. Now, we invariably find in evolution that no two things or two epochs ever correspond exactly with one another, so that when it is said that angels immediately preceded man, this must not be applied generally. We should not be justified on that account in concluding that mankind has been, had been guided by angels in the first post-Atlantean period, in the old Persian, the Egypto-Chaldean period, and so on, that would be drawing abstract conclusions. In the world of reality things are not so, for there the greatest diversity prevails. In the strictest sense of the word there are only two periods of post-Atlantean civilization in which angels had the direct and, to a certain extent, unaided guidance of mankind. These are the third, or Egypto-Chaldean, and the fifth, our own time. In the Egypto-Chaldean period, the angels were the actual leaders of civilization. How did they carry out their leadership? Here we may cite the the great Greek historian Herodotus. When the ancient Egyptians were once asked who were their first great leaders, they replied, the gods. And the ancient Egyptians, who were instructed in those things, were perfectly serious in saying that mankind was not led by normal human beings at that time, but that superhuman beings, who had completed their human evolution on the old moon, 
were their leaders. But these leaders of humanity during Egypto-Chaldean civilization could not appear directly in a human physical body. The physical body which we human beings wear is a product of the earth, depending altogether on terrestrial conditions of existence. And only those who pass through their human evolution during the earth period, in other words the human race, have a constitution or composition of soul which can live out its life in the sheath of the human physical body. As the angels passed through their human stage on the old moon, it is impossible for them to clothe themselves in such a sheath as the human physical body. They could not descend and incarnate in a physical human body of flesh. So these old leaders of the Egypto-Chaldean period did not tread the earth in human form. There were, however, clairvoyants who were susceptible of inspiration from the spiritual world. There were moments in which these seers were specially accessible to such inspiration and beheld those leaders of humanity face to face and could fill themselves with their substance. These old clairvoyants may be said to have offered up their bodies and to have said to their leaders, Behold my body, take it and enter into it, fill it with spirit and inspire it. In those ancient Egypto-Chaldean times, therefore, an ordinary human being, who was at the same time a seer, might be the instrument of a higher being. In all that he said and did, in all that he taught, that higher being who had completed his human evolution on the earth spoke and worked. This was the nature of the leadership in the ancient Egypto-Chaldean period, the chief aim of which was to guide humanity along the straight line of evolution to further evolution directly toward that which is the goal of the earth. The most eminent clairvoyant personages of the Egypto-Chaldean times, therefore, were inspired by angels who had completed their human stage of evolution on the old moon and who, working through the instrumentality of kings and priests, were the leading personages of the Egypto-Chaldean period of civilization. Side by side with these leading personalities were others. It would have been impossible to find these leading personalities in their true nature within a human body. The others were in a different position. These were beings who stood at the lowest stage, as it were, of Luciferic evolution, angelic beings who had not completed their evolution on the old moon and therefore had not fully attained the goal of lunar humanity. At the beginning of the earth period, they had not yet advanced to the point which will have been reached by man when he has fully attained the goal of his evolution at the end of the earth period. These beings also instilled their forces and impulses into the Egypto-Chaldean civilization. But as they had not completely finished their human stage, they were capable of incarnating in a human fleshly body and took their place on earth as actual men among other men. Such individuals existed not only among the ancient Chaldeans and Egyptians, but among all the nations of that age, and figure in all old popular legends. They trod the earth as men, but were in reality, as regards the inner nature of their souls, angelic beings of the old moon period who had remained behind in their evolution. The heroes honored of old by the Greeks were individuals of this class, as, for instance, Kekrops and Kadmos. All the great leaders of civilization, who not merely inspired, but actually associated with other men as men in physical bodies, who nevertheless were not, strictly speaking, human beings, but were in their physical form Maya. These were, in reality, moon beings who had been left behind. They were the heroes, superhuman beings in the lowest of the Luciferic ranks. Now, what is the actual mission of such beings? It is wisely decreed in the plan of universal evolution that the advance of humanity is not guided only by beings who have followed the straight line of evolution. We may say, if man were subject only to the spiritual leadership of normally evolved things, his advance would be too rapid and the opposition to his development too slight. 
Evolution needs barriers in order that the proper rate of speed may be observed. Evolution requires a certain obstruction, a weight. The forces which hasten its progress can only gather strength by resisting opposition. The mission of retarding evolution, of hindering its advance, is entrusted to those beings who, by the wise dispensation of the guiding spirits of the world, were left behind during the lunar planetary evolution. I said that it would be wrong to apply what I have just said of the Egypto-Chaldean period to all epochs of civilization. It would not be true of the ancient Persian civilization. At that time angelic beings were not so independent in their guidance of man. Man was then more directly subject to the archangels. It is correct to say that the ancient Persian or Zarathustrian civilization was under the spiritual guidance of the archangels, in the same way as the Egypto-Chaldean civilization was immediately under the spiritual guidance of angels. As the Egyptian clairvoyant kings and priests were inspired by angelic beings, so were Zarathustra and his disciples inspired by archangels or Amshaspans. Now if we go back still further to the first post-Atlantean civilization, that age of which only a faint echo lingers in the Vedas, we come to the so-called holy rishis, the great teachers of India. These were inspired by a still more exalted hierarchy, the spirits of personality or archai, who though they may made use of the archangels and angels as their instruments, intervened in the guidance of human evolution in a much more intimate manner than was the case later. The holy rishis of old India were inspired by the archai or spirits of personality. From the first post-Atlantean period onward, through those that followed, we have to note a continued progress of humanity, inasmuch as hierarchies of ever lower and lower grades intervene in the spiritual guidance of man. First, in the old Indian period, we find the highest, the archai or spirits of personality, then in the old Persian, the next lower hierarchy, the archangels, and in the Egyptian period, the hierarchy immediately above man, the angels. Quite peculiar conditions reigned during the Greek period. The leaders of humanity at that time were beings who, of all the superhuman beings, stood most in need of help themselves. These guides and rulers of the Greco-Latin period thus gave to man the utmost independence and freedom. Through their leadership of humanity, they desired to attain as much for themselves as man could attain through them. Hence that strange condition of things in Greco-Latin times, in which we find man, as it were, thrown upon his own resources and self-sufficiency. At no period of civilization, since the Atlantean cataclysm, had man been so much left to himself or had felt so much impelled to give vent to his own idiosyncrasies as in Greco-Latin times. Hence we see how everything in that age aimed at encouraging human individuality to express itself in its most unadulterated form. We might say that this was so because the reins of government being slackened by the leading hierarchies, man during this period was left to himself more than ever before. In our own epoch of civilization, which followed the Greco-Latin period, most remarkable circumstances again prevail. We find the same beings, those who were the leaders in the Egypto-Chaldean period, again intervening in the destinies of men. And when through clairvoyant consciousness we can come in direct touch with the beings who are the leaders of mankind, we find ourselves in the presence of those who were also our spiritual guides in Egypto-Chaldean times. We behold both classes of beings who gave man his inspiration, the angels who had fully attained the goal of lunar evolution, and the heroes who, as luciferic beings, had incarnated in bodies of flesh, having failed to attain the final goal of their lunar evolution. All these beings now reappear. We must not forget, however, that these had also passed through an evolution of their own. 
Man is now at a different stage of evolution from that which he had reached in old Egyptian times. So the angels and Luciferic angels just mentioned are at a different stage of advancement at present from that which they held when they directed the Egypto-Chaldean civilization. The tuition of man, the work which they achieved as guides of humanity, raised them at the same time to a higher stage of development. When we read the Akashic records with clairvoyant vision and see how these leaders of humanity appeared during the Egypto-Chaldean period, we find that they had already reached a certain degree of perfection. They now emerge once more from the twilight of existence and intervene anew in human evolution. Meantime, they have themselves become more perfect beings. But here again we must distinguish. Let us, meantime, disregard those beings who were Luciferic angels in Egyptian times and fix our attention on the angels properly so called who guided advancing civilization during that period. Among these were some who had reached the goal of normal evolution in the manner just described, but also certain of the angelic beings had remained behind. Consequently, there were some who, through, though they had completed their normal evolution on the moon as angels and had thus entered on the evolution of our earth as angels, yet had failed to perform their task on our planet during the Egypto-Chaldean period of civilization. At this point, they had remained behind. Therefore, among those who were still normal in Egyptian times, we again find two classes of angels. There is indeed a vast, a mighty difference between these two classes of angelic beings, a difference the comprehension of which is of an enormous importance in considering the most sublime mystery in our human evolution. I have alluded to this difference in a work which contains a reproduction of the lectures delivered by me in Copenhagen a short time ago. In order to explain this difference, we must mention a name which is in all respects indissolubly united with the whole evolution of the earth, the name of Christ. Now we know that as far as the outer evolution of the earth was concerned, Christ was incarnate for three years in the body of Jesus of Nazareth. We know that this incarnation was unique. There had never been such an incarnation before, nor will there ever be such another. That which was achieved by the Christ through his dwelling for three years in a physical human body was necessary, so that Christ should once dwell as an earthly being among earthly beings. But Christ as he is in his own peculiar nature is in no way restricted to the limits of a three years sojourn in the body of Jesus of Nazareth. He is also the guide and leader of all the beings of the upper hierarchies. He is an all-embracing, universal, and cosmic being. And as he entered human evolution through the mystery of Golgotha, so did great events also come to pass through him among the beings of the upper hierarchies. That is to say, the Christ wrought changes also in those higher worlds as time went on. How did this come to pass? As I told you, the angelic beings just described passed through a stage of evolution during the Egypto-Chaldean period, so that they now appear as more highly developed beings and intervene once more in the guidance of humanity. What has made it possible for these beings to attain a higher grade of evolution? Simply the fact that while directing the evolution of human souls in the Egypto-Chaldean period, they became at the same time disciples of Christ in the spiritual or supersensible worlds. Christ was the teacher of the angels during the Egypto-Chaldean period. His impulse then filled them, and so they have now reached a higher stage of evolution, having meanwhile absorbed the Christ impulse. If we consider attentively those leaders and guides, those spiritual instructors of Egypto-Chaldean times at the beginning of the Greco-Latin period, we find that the most highly evolved of those spiritual instructors, those who had best fitted themselves to take part in the fifth period of civilization, 
were those who had received the Christ impulse, which was not theirs before, at the beginning of the Greco-Latin period, that they were filled with it, and now as Christ-filled beings influence mankind from higher worlds. In like manner, the archangels, who at the time they inspired Zarathustra and his disciples, had not yet been filled by the Christ impulse, have meantime received that impulse. These will be the spiritual leaders of mankind in the sixth period of civilization, the one that follows our own. They will then reappear, not as they were in old Persian times, but filled with the impulse of Christ. The Archai, those spirits of personality who were the inspirers of the holy rishis in the old Indian civilization, have meantime also received the impulse of the Christ. They will be the leaders of the seventh post-Atlantean period of civilization. Then everything which was once proclaimed to mankind by the lips of the holy rishis in ancient Indian times will be fulfilled and will appear on earth in exceeding glory and majesty. It will reappear in the seventh post-Atlantean period when the vanguard of humanity will be irradiated and inflamed by the fire of the Christ impulse. The holy rishis will rise again in the radiance of the Christ Son in the seventh post-Atlantean period of civilization. We see, therefore, that for the beings of these four hierarchies, for men, but also for angels, archangels, and archai, the mystery of Golgotha, the event of Christ, comprises the fact of supremest importance which has ever taken place in our cosmic evolution. In what sense are those beings left behind, of whom we said that they had remained behind in their evolution? What has been the actual cause of this delay? They have remained behind for the reason that they turned aside from the impulse of Christ. Thus one class of guiding spirits now appear who have received Christ. The other, the retardative, angelic beings, show by the manner of their influence on our period of civilization that the Christ impulse is absent from their activity, that they are not filled with the Christ impulse. While, on the one hand, the Christ-filled angels of Egypto-Chaldean times infuse such forces into the evolution of the human race at the present day, as can raise man to spiritual life, the other angels who have turned away from the Christ impulse strive to bestow on man as inspiration all that may be called materialistic culture and science. Hence the confusion prevailing in our time between the two extremes, the one class of inspirers steeped in the purest Christ impulse, which would lead man upward to the higher life, by pursuing the aims of anthroposophy or spiritual science in the right spirit. And side by side with this, the other extreme, led by inspirers who have repudiated the impulse of the Christ and are zealous to introduce the materialistic element into human civilization. These two streams are mingled in our age, which can only be rightly understood when we realize that in it both streams of spiritual leadership prevail. If we are unable to distinguish between these two streams, or if we extol either fanatically, we are not in a position to follow clearly the actual course of our civilization. Under the leadership of the angels who are not filled with the Christ impulse, we have acquired a science today which is quite abstract, totally unspiritual, and we yearn after spirituality because the influence of the other class of angels interposes ever more and more powerfully in the guidance of mankind. All the great spiritual leaders of humanity, whether angels, archangels, or archai, who are striving to advance, have at some epoch or other, during the post-Atlantean period, been open to the Christ impulse, just as man was open to it when, at the lowest point of his evolution, through the mystery of Golgotha, Here we see the significance of the intervention of the Christ impulse in human evolution. Now we must, of course, keep clearly in mind that the highest beings, those who were the most eager seekers after spirituality, 
could not incarnate in a human fleshly body, even in the old Egypto-Chaldean times. Hence it would be, of course, still less possible for them to do so in our own day. The most outstanding spiritual leaders of mankind are only to be found, even today, by clairvoyant vision in the higher worlds. And it would be erroneous to expect to find the loftiest, most progressive and influential leaders of mankind incarnated in a physical human body. To this universal rule, that the actual leaders of evolution do not incarnate in physical human bodies during the evolution of the earth, Christ, in a certain respect, forms an exception by incarnating for three years in a physical human body. What is the reason of this? The reason is that the being whom we call Christ is in all his forces and impulses an essentially higher individuality than those beings of all the various hierarchies described, an individual higher than the archangels or even the archai, a being of whose true completeness and magnitude we can form but a faint idea. By means of his more powerful forces and impulses, it was possible for this individuality to reach a certain goal. This he did through the sacrifice of inhabiting for three years in it a human body of flesh. With this assumption of a human fleshly body by the Christ, which led to the mystery of Golgotha, something else is connected, and it is important that we should understand this. When we duly reflect upon this other factor, we gain a right understanding, not only of the nature of Christ himself, but of the nature of another being, of whom we know that he plays an important part in human evolution, one who has often been mentioned in our lectures, but who can only gradually be made fully comprehensible to us, the individuality of Lucifer. Let us picture to ourselves these two individualities, on the one hand Christ, on the other hand Lucifer. And meantime, let us take only one qualification of Christ, namely that he once on a time came down to earth and incarnated in a physical human body, and that he dwelt in that body for three years. What was the result on the physical plane of this event which terminated in the mystery of Golgotha? (laughs) The result was that the etheric and astral spheres of the earth were penetrated, as regards their substance, by the being of Christ. While before this event, the being whom we call Christ could not have been found in the etheric and astral spheres of the earth. Since then these spheres have been penetrated, have been as if saturated by him. A hint of this is given in the words by Theodora in our Rosicrucian drama, The Portal of Initiation. Whoever becomes clairvoyant in a similar manner to that in which St. Paul became clairvoyant sees into the etheric spheres of the earth and there beholds the Christ. This was formerly impossible even to the greatest seer, and only became possible in consequence of the mystery of Golgotha. You are acquainted with the fact that precisely in our own time, the twentieth century, there will be a repetition of this vision of Damascus by a number of persons. They will recognize the Christ in the etheric body, so that in the further course of evolution men will attain more and more to a knowledge of the etheric Christ. A proof of one essential feature of the evolution of the Christ is that one might have searched the earth from end to end for a trace of his physical substance after the mystery of Golgotha, wherever physical substance was to be found, without being able to find the substance of Christ as such incorporated in a body. Nevertheless, the whole earth is saturated with the Christ substance because that substance descended to the etheric sphere of the earth and will be found there for all time. It can, however, never again densify to physical substance or enter into a body of flesh. That which is now physical in the earth, its physical part, is like a snail's shell. It is of the nature of a husk, which will will one day, when the earth has reached the goal of its evolution, fall away from the totality of human souls, as the physical now falls away at death from each human soul. There will be a death of the earth, 
when it has reached the goal of its evolution. As the human soul now casts off the physical body, when man passes through the gates of death and enters a spiritual realm, so in like manner the totality of human souls will pass into a spiritual sphere at the death of the earth and will cast off all that is now physical in the earth as refuse or as a dry husk. Where where will the Christ substance be when the earth has suffered her earthly death? It will then permeate the totality of human souls as they rise from the corpse of the earth, the husk of the earth. The Christ ascends, taking with him the totality of human souls into spiritual regions there to await the new birth of the earth, that which in spiritual science is called Jupiter. The essential part of the nature of Christ is that he continues in an entirely spiritual form to guide the evolution of humanity and that he will never again enter into dense physical substance but will be associated with it only until the death of the earth and no longer because his etheric being interpenetrates the physical part, which will then be cast off like a corpse when the earth will have reached the goal of its evolution. After the mystery of Golgotha, Christ retained nothing, absolutely nothing, which might awaken in him a longing to enter a physical body and tread the earth once more. It was once and for all a complete renunciation of physical materiality. The great hidden truth connected with the mystery of Golgotha is this, that through his sacrifice, through his dwelling for three years in a physical body, the Christ left henceforth nothing behind which could be cast away as a husk at the death of the earth. Because since the mystery of Golgotha, the physical substance of the earth has certainly been penetrated by the Christ without his uniting himself with it, Nothing remains in the nature of Christ which could look back with longing to the cast-off earthly husk at the death of the earth. That husk will be thrown off at the death of the planet. The earth will then shine like a star. And from other planets, peopled by beings looking into space, the earth will appear as a star floating in the firmament. Will all beings then sever their connection, as Christ did, and all who belong to him with that star, which will have fallen away like a husk at the death of the earth? No. I have just spoken to you of certain beings who turned away from the Christ impulse in the Egypto-Chaldean times. Among these there are some who will again turn away from him. Such beings may, under certain circumstances, in times to come, actually incarnate in physical human bodies and roam the earth as physical beings. At the same time, they will experience a certain kind of longing for that star which has been thrown off at the death of the earth and which will shine in the world of space as a splendid star of wondrous beauty. Everything in the nature of men's souls that appertains to the Christ will, in future periods of human evolution, behold this star with admiration after the death of the earth. But they will not yearn for it. They will not say, That star is our home. These human souls, together with the souls of the beings of the upper hierarchies, will no more yearn for that star than the souls now on earth yearn for the planet Mars. They turn their eyes toward it, receive its beneficent influences, but do not long for it. Footnote, the new earth becomes Jupiter, and Jupiter will have its own moon or husk of earth. And a footnote. If Christ had not intervened in the evolution of the earth, there would have been a most momentous difference in the fate of the human race as a whole. Let us assume for a moment, hypothetically, that Christ had not intervened in human evolution. The earth would still have suffered death, man and the upper hierarchies would have continued their evolution into the higher worlds, but would have borne within them a continual longing for that remote star, that husk of the earth, lighting up space space with such marvelous brilliancy. Had Christ not delivered them, human beings would one day look down from Jupiter with tragic longing upon that star, the product or husk of the earth. 
They would not merely gaze with admiration upon it, but would exclaim with longing, That is our home! How sad, how grievous that we must be here and not on that star, which is our true home! Such would be the divergence from the actual path of evolution, had the Christ impulse not been united with the earth. (coughs) Liberation from the earth, freedom to follow a future evolution, this was the mission of Christ on earth for mankind. We see the immensity of the deed of Christ. We see that through the coming of Christ to earth, mankind was enabled to prepare future changes in the evolution of our planet. Can we find an example of the longing spoken of above, of beings who inhabit another planet and who yearn after some other heavenly body as their true home? Yes, we have many such examples, and one of these may now be contrasted with the Christ. During the evolution of the old moon, there were mighty beings, lofty spirits, who nevertheless, in a certain respect, had failed to attain the full measure of perfection possible for them on the moon. Among them was a host led by one of themselves. When the lunar evolution was at an end, these had not reached their goal, and consequently were still in arrears when the evolution of the earth began. This host now took part in the evolution of the earth and participated in the guidance of mankind. They worked within human souls with a tragic longing after a star of the universe which had been cast out of the old lunar evolution in the manner described in the book Esoteric Science. Within the limits of the spiritual evolution of the earth, there are great, lofty, eminent beings under the leader of that host who really experience this longing for a star outside, in space, which they regard as their true home, but on which they cannot dwell, because they were forced to leave the moon and take up their abode on earth without having completed their lunar task. These are the hosts of Lucifer, and Lucifer himself takes part in the evolution of the earth with an inextinguishable yearning in his soul for his true home, the star of Venus, outside in the universe. This is the most conspicuous trait in the Luciferic nature, regarded cosmically. The nature of the planet of Venus enters the consciousness of the clairvoyant when he reads the soul of Lucifer, and in doing so he experiences the tragic yearning of Lucifer like a vast cosmic nostalgia for the star Phosphorus, Lucifer or Venus. All that was cast off like a husk by Lucifer and the Luciferic hosts, and which disintegrated at the death of the old moon in the same way as the physical body of the human soul disintegrates at death, shines down upon us from heaven as Venus. Footnote, Lucifer was cast off from the old moon and should have gone on to Venus or Mercury. End of footnote. In what has just been said, something cosmic has been presented to you, both as regards our Earth and as regards the neighboring planet Venus. Footnote. Dr. Steiner explains in other lectures that occultly Venus is Mercury, Mercury Venus. End of footnote. This gives us a picture which was not, it is true, experienced by the Greek soul in the express manner in which it has just been described but which nevertheless lived in the feelings and sensations of the Greeks. In moments of elevation, when he turned to the stars, especially to Venus, the Greek felt in his soul the intimate connection between that star and certain beings who influence and inspire the spheres of earth. The ancient Greek feeling in his soul what Lucifer was to the earth might have indulged in the following reflection, quote, the Luciferic principle breathes through our earthly existence. Close quote. Looking up to the planet Venus, he might have said, quote, That is the point, moving through space, to which the longings of Lucifer ceaselessly tend. Close quote. Such were the sensations of the Greek soul toward one of the wonders of the world. This shows us at the same time, in a vivid manner, how remote from the feelings of the Greek soul are the methods of modern astronomy, which beholds Venus in space and describes it merely as a physical globe. What was the star Venus to the soul of the Greek? 
It was that region in space which the Greek learned to know by contemplating in clairvoyant consciousness the spiritual content of the soul of Lucifer, where he perceived the great yearning which stretched like a living bridge from the earth to the star Venus. This longing experienced by the Greek soul as the longing of Lucifer was felt also by this Greek soul to be a part of the substance of Venus. It was not the mere physical planet which the Greek saw. He saw something which had been severed from the Luciferic nature as the physical body is severed from man when he passes through the gates of death and as the corpse of the earth will be severed from the earth when it has reached the goal of its evolution. The only difference is that the physical body of man is destined to disintegrate, while the body of Lucifer, when it falls away from the soul nature, is destined to shine in the firmament like a star. In these words we have at the same time described what a star is in the spiritual sense. We have cited Venus as an example. What are the stars, nature's wonders, to one who has a living conception of the wonders of the world? They are the bodies of the gods. That which has gone forth into space from the bodies of the gods has become a star. In this spirit the Greek looked up to the firmament, to the planets and fixed stars. Once upon a time, he said, the spiritual beings whom we honor as our gods were there in space. They passed through an evolution. When they had reached the point which signifies physical death for man during his earthly life, the moment had arrived for these gods in which their physical substance parted from them to become a star. Stars are the bodies of gods whose souls carry on their activities in a new manner in the world, independently of these bodies, as Lucifer became independent of his body Venus and continues to live in the evolution of our earth. This may be called a spiritualized conception of nature, a spiritualized conception of the world. It has nothing in common with the washed-out theory of pantheism which declares that all nature is penetrated by a single divine being. It is not enough to say this. We must know when we look up to that distant world that we cannot give a mere abstract definition of the stars and call them bodies in which the gods appear. The stars are bodies forsaken by the gods when these gods have themselves advanced to other stages of evolution. The difference between all planetary gods and the God Christ is that at the death of the earth the God Christ leaves no such physical star behind, nor any unspiritualized remnant, but passes over completely into a spiritual state, and as a spirit advances with the souls of men toward existence on Jupiter. This constitutes one of the essential differences between Christ and the planetary gods. It is of the utmost importance to keep this difference well in mind, for it shows us that the entire significance of the mystery of Golgotha would immediately be lost were it possible, after that mystery had become an accomplished fact, that the spirit to whom we rightly give the name of Christ should ever again incarnate in a physical body. Were that which appertains to Christ and to which we are justified in applying the name of Christ to reincarnate again in a physical body after the mystery of Golgotha, the first seed of a star would be sown which would remain behind in the future. To the physical substance of that first seed others would be associated, forming the nucleus of that retrograde star and the purpose of the mystery of Golgotha in its profound significance could never be attained. If Christ were to, den to deny himself altogether and were to annul the mystery of Golgotha, he need only incarnate in some physical body and thus create a center of attraction of a material nature to which others would be attached. Further incarnations of the same being would then be necessary. This would give rise to the creation of a star after which humanity would yearn for all time. Such yearning must not be caused by Christ. 
Hence no one is justified in associating in any way with the name of Christ that which could possibly incarnate in a fleshly body after the mystery of Golgotha. Such a claim would display the most prodigious want of understanding of the mystery of Golgotha and would show an entire ignorance of its import. From the moment that one has really grasped the mystery of Golgotha, it becomes an impossibility to connect the name of Christ with any being incarnate in a physical human body after that great event. To apply the name of Christ to any being incarnate in a physical human body after the mystery of Golgotha would either be a misuse of the name of Christ or would show an absolute misunderstanding of the mystery of Golgotha. It is of extreme importance that these things should be understood. For without this understanding it is impossible to view in its true light the all-embracing nature of the Christ in relation to human evolution. The forces generated by this understanding in a certain region of the human soul and by the final renunciation of all desire for the earth must be strengthened, as are all forces, by opposition. Hence, in accordance with the wise governance of the world, certain beings will again be left behind, who we might say, like the guiding angelic beings of Egypto-Chaldean times, the archangels of ancient Persian times, or like the leading archai of the old Indian period, are not penetrated with the Christ impulse, and who, therefore, will continue to guide evolution without that impulse. These, to whom the name of Christians will not be given, will represent in future ages of human evolution that element which will doubtless give rise to a certain longing, and also to a certain tie with that residue of a planet, that star which will shine in universal space and will be seen from the new Jupiter in like manner as our Venus, Mars and Jupiter are seen from our Earth. This is essentially a different current of human evolution and a different stream of evolution among the upper hierarchies. It directs our thoughts back to those influences which will be exercised by the future planetary neighbors of Jupiter on the humanity of Jupiter. We must keep these two streams absolutely apart, then, having grasped this greatest truth, we shall also have an understanding of the smaller. Everywhere we see the interaction of these two streams. Everywhere we see the progressive Christ being, leading humanity onward to a higher conception of the Christ. And on the other hand we see the hindering forces, to whom we dare not give the name of Christ, who incarnate in human physical bodies, and who can indeed acquire a knowledge of Christ, but cannot attain to such a Christ impulse as did the angels who finished their evolution in Egypto-Chaldean times. There we see beings who may one day descend to incarnation in bodies of flesh, but we must distinguish between the, those two classes. All the materialistic thought of our day comes from the spirits of hindrance who obstruct the progressive course of evolution and did we expect the salvation of mankind to come from such individualities alone as could incarnate at some future time in a physical body, this expectation would also be inspired by those spirits of hindrance. For these are materialistic principles and lead man away from the self-development which gives him perception of the spiritual worlds. They seduce man to venerate individuals incarnate in physical bodies merely because these can be perceived by physical senses. The ancient Greek of pre-Christian times had no clear conception of what I have just said in relation to Christ because the mystery of Golgotha had not as yet taken place. But the Greeks had a knowledge of Lucifer and his connection with Venus, and of the other planetary gods and their connection with their stars. All these perceptions and feelings, which for the Greeks sprang from their ancient wisdom, are the preliminary steps to those ideas, feelings, and impulses of soul which were awakened in the wise Greek of old when the name of Dionysus was pronounced. The statements made in this lecture were necessary in order that in a subsequent one we may go more minutely into those wonders of the world, those wonders of nature, 
which the ancient Greek had in mind when he spoke of Dionysus. The way has thus been prepared, which leads to what is more akin to the human being, to his inner nature and to the ordeals of his soul. The subject of the next lecture, therefore, will be the conception of Dionysus. The end of lecture four.